All right, so we're going to talk about uh, game development. We're going to talk specifically about an issue that uh, a lot of people in our Discord get really upset about sometimes. Um, I wanted to kind of get to the nuts and bolts of RNG. And you see RNG used a lot by game players. Uh, for those, uh, like one person doesn't know, it means random number generation. Um, random number generation is a, a way of talking about probability in games and using randomness instead of predefined things in games to make things happen. Um, in general, the sort of uh, game verse likes to say that RNG is terrible, um, especially people who play card games. Oh, it's too much RNG. Why'd they use RNG? I hate RNG. RNG is terrible. I'm, I'm, uh, settle down, Beavis. Um, random numbers have been a part of games for as long as there have been games. Um, they, they, they historically go back to the times of uh, dice. I'm not going to get into all that, but you know people have used dice for a really long fucking time. So why do we use... RNG in games. What's the what's the point of using randomness in games? Uh, well, the big thing is um, I want a game to not go exactly as it was planned, right? Um, and there's a couple reasons I might want that to happen, right? Um, one is if you're going to play a game more than once, if you want to have any sort of replayability, it can't be the same every every single time. At that point, you're just a movie, right? So I want to know that if I play this game again, are there going to be different results? Now, obviously, we can give the player choices and we can say the game is going to be different based on the number of player choices that you have. But at that point, you begin to say, well, how many player choices do I have? Um, and it becomes quite a large game if you have to actually designate every single player choice that the player is going to make and say, well, that's the way the game's going to play. At some point, you might want to say, hey, I, I want this game to be randomly different when you play it so that even if you make the same choices, it comes out a little bit different. That may be a thing that you want as a designer. Um, another thing you may want to do is you may want to surprise or delight your user. You may want to have something that you didn't expect. Usually when I do this thing, this thing happens, but this time I did it and something different happened. Now, um, obviously, some people will argue and say, well, no, 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 the game should be defined entirely by the player and it should always be done, you know, I should know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, eh. Sometimes you want people to be surprised by something. Um, one thing that we don't talk about very much is sometimes you need to make your AI dumber. And I know that people are like, make the AI dumber. No, all the games I play, the AI is way too stupid. Well, yes and no. Um, if you play, for instance, uh, first-person shooters, I can tell you right now that any programmer who's even basically started making a first-person shooter can make bots that you can't possibly destroy. Um, look, you getting your mouse and, and making your mouse move so that you can aim on somebody and pushing the trigger button and shooting somebody on the head, that skill is something that you have to master. Computers are real good at that, right? Um, I can make a bot that can make that can make every single headshot every single time, 100% without fail, every time that even one pixel of your head shows from behind a wall. Computers can do that, right? And sometimes that's not fun. In fact, I would say that's always not fun. And so a lot of times what we're using randomness for is we're actually dumbing down AI and saying, look, the AI is going to try to shoot you in the head, but that shot's going to be offset by X number of however we want to sort it, pixels or whatever, um, to make sure that the computer doesn't always get a headshot on you, right? Um, sometimes in very simple strategy games where there really aren't that many choices, the computer can think ahead and figure out, you know, look, this is the by far the best decision to make and I'm going to make that decision and can consistently uh, defeat you. We can use randomness to alleviate that some. Um, the other thing we can do is we can make AI not completely predictable. Even in even in strategy games with with reasonably good AI, you can figure out pretty quickly why is the AI doing what the AI is doing. You know, when I build this or when I move this unit here, that AI is always going to do this thing. And once you've figured out, because one thing computers are not good at doing is um, adapting and changing to what you do. That's something that's, that takes a lot of work to program a computer to do. So sometimes you could fake it and you can say, you know, for instance, 
every time I move my unit next to this unit, that unit is going to move backwards. If I know that that's the way the AI works and it always works that way, I can very quickly come up with pretty simple tactics that will kill that AI very quickly. So instead, uh, we can add a little bit of randomness to it and say that there's a percentage chance that he will move away when you move next to him. But there's a chance that he won't. There's a chance that he'll attack and you don't know. And that level of, I don't know what he's going to do, kind of simulates the idea that you're playing against a real person. Um, and so those are kind of the, the reasons why you would use random numbers. Um, and in, in strategy games, we might even use random numbers to say that when you do something, the results are not always definitely known, which does actually kind of model the real world as well. If I were to go, um, you know, swing a sword at somebody, I don't know that I'm going to hit them. Now, if I had a perfect knowledge of physics in the world and everything, I would know, you know, whether or not I was going to hit them, but nobody has that knowledge. And so there's a chance that I miss or I hit you on the helmet or I drop my sword or something like that. And, you know, uh, games since time immemorial have used randomness to determine that. So this is why we use it. So why the hate? Um, why do people bitch about RNG so much? Um, what is it they don't like about RNG? Because they don't sometimes. You hear a lot of people bitch about it. So really you've got sort of two cases of randomness in your game. One, things are not random enough. Or things are too random, right? Or to put it in a different way, the randomness has a big effect on the game or the randomness has a little effect on the game. Let's look at too little. You can have not enough randomness in a game, but still have randomness in a game. Let's say, for instance, you have units and the units all do damage. And the damage is, you know, between, you could, let's say a unit uh, can take 15 points of damage before it dies. And my sword does between one and two points of damage. Well, at that point, you're like, well, why, why are you even bothering, right? I mean, the one and two is such a small margin of error compared to the potential uh, thing that you're putting up against, it doesn't really add much to the game. It just adds unnecessary complexity to the game. And so if you're going to add randomness to your game, whether you're adding in uh, random damage numbers or random reaction to something, that reaction has to be... Um, actually, my, my example, Javi mentions that my example is bad, and I'll, I'll get back to why my example was bad here in a second. Um, we're going to talk about that exact thing. Uh, the difference between one and two is quite huge. We'll, we'll get back to that. Um, my point being, um, if you're going to add randomness to the game, you need to make sure that the randomness is large enough that it matters or else don't bother, right? I mean, that's the simple answer. So let's look at the other side, which is what people bitch about a lot more often. And that is that there is too much randomness in a game. And where people start hating randomness in a game, where they feel there's too much randomness in a game, is when they feel like their actions as a player are no longer defining the game. That the randomness is more important than their tactical thoughts or strategic thoughts, their planning. I made all these plans and I moved my units and I thought I'd made a great thing, but then the randomness was so high, I, I might as well have just done everything. I might as well just moved all my units randomly because the, the random number generator was going to make all the difference. So where you want your randomness in the game to sit is somewhere between those two poles. Uh, where it is significant enough that it matters, but it never matters more than the player's uh, determination of what he wants to do, right? You want to make sure that when your player says, I'm going to put this unit here and this unit here, and we're going to use these spells, that she is rewarded for that as being a good decision, um, even if the random numbers say, oh, okay, well, that didn't go as well as you had hoped, Um it's a good strategy over time is still a good strategy. It's not destroyed by the randomness. Um, the other problem with randomness, and I think this is where uh, on the developer side where there's a lot more problems, is it does make it harder to make real defined experiences. And here I want to talk about my experience working with Ubisoft for a little bit. Um, when I made uh, Far Cry, we... We had a lot of trouble because Ubisoft very much wanted to have what they called wow scenes. And wow scenes were very cinematic, very specific experiences that they knew were going to be wow. They were going to, you know, 
And when they defined those experiences, they needed things to be exactly the way they had sort of laid them out, right? Um, the helicopter is going to come from over there and the sun is going to shine through the helicopter rotors and the guys are going to jump and you're going to see them silhouetted in front of the sun. Well, yeah, that sounds great. And it sounds, you know, neat and cinematic. Uh, but to do that, I needed to know that the helicopter would be here and that you would be here and that you wouldn't be dead already and that there wouldn't be something between you and the helicopter. Uh, there's all of these things that I needed to make sure happened to make that exact wow scene that they want happen. And every one of those decisions to force that situation involved taking uh, choice away from the player and also involved taking randomness out of the game. Both of those things had to be controlled to ensure that this particular situation that Ubisoft wanted to have happen, happen. And this was a consistent fight between Crytek, um, especially a couple people at Crytek, uh, myself included, and Ubisoft, uh, where we wanted the player decisions to have more meaning and we wanted the the player decisions to have a certain amount of randomness to it so that when I play the game again, maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe the helicopter doesn't come. Maybe I don't see the guy through the rotors of the helicopter, blah, 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 blah. Um, and there, there's, a, uh, there's a real debate about um, why, you know, which one is more important? Is it more important to have this exact experience or is it more important to allow the player and the random number generators to create new and different experiences every time you play, but those newer and different experiences are not going to be completely defined by uh, what we want them to look like. So this is this is kind of the the challenge. Now I want to now that I've talked about that, I want to mention. Um, wait, I had another, I had another slide. Where's my? There we go. That's the slide I wanted. Um, complexity is not necessarily random. Um, going back to my explanation of the way uh, Ubisoft wanted things to jump from the helicopter and wanted these wow scenes to happen, there were sort of two factors involved in there. One factor is how complex was the situation that led up to that, right? So in this case, the big, the big sort of um, mystery was the artificial intelligence and how the AI would behave. And knowing that the AI were going to jump from this helicopter in this exact way and knowing that the helicopter was going to show up at this exact moment and knowing that the helicopter was going to come from this exact spot, all of that could easily be pre-scripted. But if we pre-scripted it, it would be the same every time you played it. Now, we could have created some complexity that would have looked a little bit random. We could have said, you know, given this situation, the AI will choose to take the helicopter from here or from here or from here, debating, depending on what I did. Now, that's not random. That's still defined. We've still defined that if situation A, B, and C have been met, then the helicopter comes from over here. But if they haven't been met, the helicopter comes from over here. We could make it even more complex and say, okay, the helicopter is going to have different units in it based on what you've been doing earlier on in the game, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of complexity the player will see it possibly as being random if he doesn't understand why that complexity is there or doesn't understand how his decisions affected the way the computer responded to what he chose to do. And so for many cases, I think there is this sort of gray area between complexity and randomness where at a certain level of complexity, the player doesn't understand why the computer is making the decisions that it's making. And as far as she knows, it might as well be random, right? Um, and this is, this is important to understand because at some point, maybe just make it random, right? I can remember there was a, a game that, that Alan and I were working on in the early days of Boom Zap. It was one of our very first games. It was called Jelly Boom. Uh, it was this uh, silly little uh, puzzle game that we made. And I very much wanted to make all of these pre-scripted levels where the unit, and it was it was these little things would drop, and it was, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember what game we based it off of. We based it off an old uh, game, like Super Puzzle Fighter or something like that. I can't remember the name of the game we based it off of. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the little blocks, blocks that fell from the sky fell in a very specific order because I thought I knew how that would work out but the thing is, as you um, 
the blocks as they fell, they made bigger blocks. And the thing is, I didn't really, there was no randomness to it, right? There was, there was only the predefined script that we gave the player of how the blocks were going to fall. And that never changed. If you played level five, it always, the blocks always fell exactly the same way, right? Um, and then there was what the player did about that down at the bottom, how they moved the blocks and what, what that formed, right? The thing is, the player never really understood that those blocks fell in that particular order. And the player usually didn't play those levels again, so he didn't see them fall in the same order again. And so uh, the player playing the game never really understood the complexity, and they just assumed it was random. And at some point, Alan got mad at me and was like, Chris, why are you trying to beat the random generator? Why don't you just make it random? And it was, a, it was a valid point. Maybe it would have been easier to just make it random and the player would have assumed the same thing they assumed in the second case, which is that it was random. Um, so I would look at when you're making your game, if you are making complex decision-making trees or complex uh, systems, especially when you're making like strategy games that have complex systems, ask yourself, can the player actually read these systems does she know why the ai behaves in the way that it behaves and if she can't derive that it is for all intents and purposes as she sees it random right now it may not be random it may actually be defined by certain things and if i played it out and gave the computer the exact same inputs a second time i may get the exact same response which does mean it is not random by definition but if the player can't tell the difference between that and random, then just make it random because random's a lot easier to do than these large complex situations. So the key that I want to get to that is the player should probably know when they're playing whether or not something is random and what the system is that is presenting those random numbers and what the limits of that randomness are so that they can make reasonable decisions. If you have a situation where you're gonna pick up a bottle and you're gonna drink from that bottle and it is going to be either a poison or a health potion, you need to give the player some sort of idea. What is the chance that it is a health potion? What is the chance that it is a poison? Is it half and half? Is it one in a hundred that it's a poison? Without this, um, that randomness can be very upsetting to the player. Um, the other thing is when you're using randomness like this, um, you know, randomness versus complexity, you need to make sure that you're putting that randomness in a place that sparks joy. Um, if I get to the very end of a level and at the end of the level it says, drink this bottle, yes or no, and I drink it and it automatically kills me, that's not going to spark joy. Unless the player knew there was a 1 in 100 chance that it was going to kill him and the other 99% chance it was going to be a super health potion, at that point it might be an interesting gamble for the player. They might be like, oh no, I may have to play this whole level again, but there's a, you know, only a 1% chance I'll take the risk, right? In that case, it may be a fun thing for the player. But without having that information available to him, uh, it's just a, a random irritation to the player. And so I would look very carefully when you're using randomness in your games. Does the player understand the randomness and does the player understand the limits of that randomness so that they can actually take joy from that randomness? Um, so all that being said, I want to walk through just a couple basic rules about probability. Um, this is stuff that uh, I have always assumed everybody knew. But I am genuinely surprised how many young designers I talk to that don't understand some of the basic systems of probability. And I know that a lot of people are going to hear this and they're going to be like, oh my God, Chris, this is so basic. You would be amazed how many people don't know this. Um, so I have with me uh, my big bag of dice um, because you can't be a designer without a big bag of dice. There's a law. So let's pull out, um, for the moment, let's pull out a, a simple... This is a simple wooden die, um, six-sided die, nothing special about it. And this is your most sort of basic kind of probability. I could put, I could pick up a coin and you know, be a 50-50 chance. A die is going to be a one in six chance. And you can represent that as a decimal or a fraction or however you want to do it. You get the idea. You guys took basic math. 
This is a one in six chance of something happening. And this is sort of your basic form of randomness. So for instance, I could have a weapon that does um, one to six damage, would be represented by one die. And each one of those sort of possibilities, this is this is flat probability, right? Now, it doesn't have to be equal flat probability. I could, for instance, say, if I roll this die, all right, let me get a, for, to make my math a little easier. Here's a 10-sided die, all right? So here's a 10-sided die. I could say that on one to six, you die, and from seven to 10, you live, right? I now have a 60% chance of dying and a 40% chance of living. That's basic math. Everybody understands it, right? So just because it's, it's uh, flat doesn't mean that it's equal, right? So I can have any... Sort of, you know, I could I could pick two of these ten-sided dice. I got another one in here somewhere, don't I? Where's another? Come on, where's another ten-sided die? Never one when you want. All right, so now I got two ten-sided die. Now I can quickly make my uh, one to a hundred. It maps precisely to percentages. All right, uh, if I roll underneath an eighty on this, then you know, all right, then that's an eighty percent chance of something happening. I roll a forty, it happened. Right, very straightforward. Now we can adjust that by creating um, bell curve probability, right? We can create um, more complex probability. I'll go back to my six-sided die here. This is some standard old Dungeons and Dragons foolishness. Um, for those of you who remember playing Dungeons and Dragons, here's your three six-sided dice. And with your three six-sided dice, I'm gonna roll my stats, right? And so I'm going to get a number somewhere between 3 and 18, right? I can get a roll 1 on each one of these. I can roll a 6 on each one of these. That would be 3 or 18, right? Um, or somewhere in between. But as your basic um, math education tells you, the odds of me getting all three of these on 1 are quite small, and the odds of me getting all three of these on 6 are quite small. The odds of me getting... A six on one and a three on one and a one on one and something like that. Some mix of that is going to create a basic bell curve of probability where it's going to be more likely that I'm going to get a seven or an eight or somewhere in the middle, right? And this probability is going to increase um, the more of these I get, right? So if I only have two of these six-sided dice, this is two to 12, right? And the chances that I'm going to get that two or that 12 are larger than if I have three dice, which is obviously three to, three times six is what, 18? Um, so this is my three to 18. The chances of me getting a three or an 18 are much lower than the chances of me getting a two or a 12, right? And, you know, I could, I could sit down and do all the actual math, uh, you know, the internet will tell you. But as I add more and more dice to this, the chances of me being on either one of the extremes is going to get increasingly lower, and the chances that I'm gonna bell out in the middle somewhere are increasingly high. And we can represent that, you know, the old Dungeons and Dragons way of representing that was 1d6, right? One six-sided die, or 2d6, right? And the sort of common misunderstanding that people who don't understand probability, they assume that 2d6, which is a number between two and 12, is the same as two to 12. It's not. In 2 to 12, I have an equal chance of rolling 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But in 2d6, I have a much higher chance of hitting a 6 or a 7 or somewhere in the middle of that bell curve than I do of hitting a 2 or a 12 on the edges of that bell curve, right? Now, you can play around with that kind of bell curve and create all kinds of possibilities if you want. Um, and interestingly enough, we did this in Last Regiment. We used to have damage based on this. Um, we used to have 2d6 or 2d4 damage because I thought it was fun. But this goes back to the whole does your player understand the complexity problem. We had a lot of people who didn't know what 2d6 was. And I assume that our players all had enough basic strategy game experience to know 2d6 meant a bell curve between 2 and 12. They didn't. Um, it was actually quite confusing for them. And so at some point we said, fine, whatever. We moved it to a flat 2 to 12. And we just said this does between 2 to 12 points of damage. Um, interesting, but true. So 
you can play around with probability like that. I'm not sure it's easy to explain to the player. Now, there are a lot of times where you want to have some probability that you maybe don't explain to the player, maybe the way the AI behaves or something like that. Um, you can have those things based off of a bell curve like that, where the player doesn't really need to know exactly what the number is going to be, but they do know, oh, well, this guy seems to more or less often do this, but sometimes he'll do this sort of uh, behavior on the edges. You can use that as well. Um, I want to talk about a different kind of probability, and this is based on cards. And <clears throat> for this, I'm using... I got this kind of game, uh, this very cute little card game uh, uh, from uh, Tokyo Game Show. This is Poop, the game. Um, and it is a game where you uh, where you have poop. Um, it's kind of a cute little game. I used to play it with my son. But I just needed some cards to explain some probability. Uh, and this is important for those of you who are building deck building games or trying to understand deck building games. So for the purpose of this explanation, I have... Uh, six pieces of poop in my hand. Um, you can see I have pink poop and green poop and blue poop in my hand. Um, you can see the cute little poop there. Um, so anyway, obviously, just like rolling dice, we can have some basic flat probability where we say, um, I'm going to draw one card from these six cards. Now we know, because there are two blue, two green, and two pink poops, in my hand, we know that there is a one in three chance, or I could say a two in six chance, right? Which, for those of you who remember how to reduce your fractions, two in six is the same as one in three. So I can either choose a green or a blue or a pink card, thus giving me a basic uh, chance to draw one of these. Um, that's pretty basic. Now, where it gets a little more complicated is how you want to handle a deck in a game. Now, when we were making Last Regiment, um, I originally had a deck where we said, you know what? This is your deck. You're going to draw from this deck, but the deck is stable, which means if I draw this green card and take this green card out of the deck, next time I draw, I'm going to go back to my original deck and I'm going to draw from the same deck. Now, in this case, I'm not actually getting a deck. What I'm actually getting is I'm just defining there's a one in three chance of picking any one of these three cards every time I draw a card, right? Which is very straightforward. But the problem with one in three cards every time I draw a card is it is actually theoretically possible to just keep drawing red cards. And every time I draw a red card, I put the red card back in the deck and oh shit, I drew a red card again. And I may have a very long time before I ever get to the green card. Now, in over time, if I'm looking over a lot of time, um, I will draw them all equally. If I draw from this deck a million times and I add it all up, unless something very weird is happening, over time I will draw about a third of the time this, and a third of the time this, and a third of the time this. But over one short iteration, let's say one video game worth of drawing these cards, I may have a, a game session where I just kept drawing the red card putting it back in and drawing the red card again. Now, every time I draw the red card, and this is very important for understanding probability, whatever I did before this has no effect on what I'm going to do later, right? So you say, well, the, the odds are really low that you're ever going to draw that red card five times in a row. Yeah, that's absolutely true over a large span of time. But for each individual draw, the chances that I'm going to draw this red card remain exactly one in three as long as I keep putting the card back in the deck before I draw again. The same as if I were to draw, roll this six-sided die, the chances of me rolling a one and two are going to be the same every single time I roll this die, two and six or one and three, no matter how many times I roll the die, right? And even if I rolled a, a six ten times in a row, and you say the chances of me rolling eleven times in a row are really, really small, when I actually roll that die, the chances of me rolling a six remain one in six. Now, the nice thing about having a deck of options instead of basic dice type probability is we can actually adjust the odds every time the player makes a decision, right? Now, obviously, 
it's a computer game. We don't actually have dice or cards. But for you as a designer, thinking about things, thinking about your randomness as a deck or as a set of either flat or bell curved possibility, um, sometimes the deck is better if you assume I actually leave the card out, right? So let's say I have uh, a chance to draw from my deck of six cards, right? And on my first draw, oh, my poop is upside down. <laughs> so the first draw, I do draw the red poop, right? So when I draw the red poop, I now only have five options left, right? So when I originally drew the red poop, there was a one, or excuse me, a two and six chance, which is a one and three chance, right? So a 33.1333 chance that I drew a red poop. Now, things have changed. I can't draw this poop anymore. I've already taken that poop. So now I only have five poops left. And so now the chances that I would draw the red poop are one in five, not two in five. And the chances that I would draw a blue or a green poop are now two and five and two and five, right? So the chance that I would draw a green or a blue poop is now higher than it was before and much higher than the chances that I would draw another red poop, right? So my first decision does actually affect the probability of my second decision. So on my second round, I draw the, what is that? The green poop. All right. I've been eating avocados apparently. So now I've again adjusted the odds. I now have a one in four chance of another green poop, a one in four chance of another red poop, and a two in four chance of a blue poop. Now what this gets you in terms of game dy dynamics and, and playing games is you can say, I want to have a number of things that can happen in the game and I want that thing to happen eventually. I want to make sure that if I go through the time and the effort and the trouble of making one random possibility happening, if the player keeps playing, keeps making decisions, I would like over time for him to eventually get to the point where there is nothing else that can happen than having a blue poop. Because I really want at some point him to have a blue poop, right? And I think more often than not, this is what a designer really wants when they're using randomness. And so I would encourage you to look at, you know, and again, uh, Last Regiment, the game I'm making right now, is a game that includes a deck and does draw from a deck and uses this mechanic and it looks like cards. But this doesn't have to actually be cards. This could be any kind of decision that, that you're making in the game. Um, but you could handle it in that way so that you know at some point if the player keeps hitting this situation and they keep drawing a result from this situation, sooner or later they're going to get to that result that you want them to get to. Um, I think more often than not when people are complaining about the randomness in their game, it's because the low probability things happen so infrequently most of the time that they get frustrated and then every now and then the low frequency things happen a bunch and they're like, oh, this is broken. We need to make it less common and they make it less common and then it never happens and they're constantly fighting that. A more deck-like probability sometimes works better for people. Um, I want to talk about one other thing. Let us for a moment say that we're going to have, and this is something that we were talking about earlier, let's say for a moment that we're going to have a weapon in our game and it's going to do damage. One of the things you have to look at when, you're, when, you're, when you decide that you're going to use some randomness in your game is what kind of range are you giving the player and how important is that RNG going to be? And one of the things that uh, we messed up on earlier in the game, I wanted to, I'll walk you through the whole decision tree, um, I wanted to keep the numbers in our strategy game low. Uh, the strategy game has units, the units fight each other. Uh, when the units fight each other, um, you know, they, they, they have kind of a hearthstone style mechanic where you're going to do this much damage when you attack and you've got this many hit points, pretty basic, uh, video game stuff. And I wanted to keep those numbers low because I wanted to make sure that people could do the math easily in their head. So I said, well, let's, let's make a normal attack be one point of damage. Like that's the, that's the lowest damage. And you know, a really, really bad attack would be like, I don't know, like five or six, right now. One of the issues with this is by making a range like that, by saying the range is between one and five, I have said that I cannot adjust this 
because my 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 level of granularity here is one, right? I can't I can't do 0.5 damage. I can only do one damage. Because my level of granularity is one, and the minimum damage that I'm going to be doing is one, right? And most you know small units like civil civilian units do one damage, giving them a bonus, even the smallest granularity bonus that I can give them actually doubles their attack, right? Let's say I've got a farmer and the farmer has an attack of one and he gets a bonus on a, uh, fancy weapons and fancy weapons gives him a plus one. I've actually given him a plus 100 attack or 100% attack, right? When I start adding randomness to this, right? Remember the smallest number on this die is one. So I'm so if I want to create something that has any meaningful level of randomness, let's say one to six, or even let's go all the way down to uh, one to four, right? Even if I'm only having a random number of one to four, I'm actually saying I'm going to add 100 to 400 percent of your attack. That's a lot, right? That's a very big difference. Um, and so suddenly, and especially when you start looking at health numbers and I say, you know, this thing's health is going to be 10, right? Well, okay. I have a cannon and my cannon does one to six, right? The difference between rolling a one and rolling a six on this die for a unit that has between one and 10 health points is ginormous, right? The difference between zero and one is huge, right? So what do you do? Well, one thing you do is you have greater granularity, right? So instead of having a unit that has, let's say, 1 to 10 hit points, we might consider having a unit that has 10 to 100 hit points, right? Now, that's exactly the same, right? If I used to have a unit that had 1 and one that had 5 and one that had 10 hit points, I can now have a unit that has 10, 50, and 100 hit points, and mathematically, it's exactly the same, except... Now I can say something like this cannon does 2d6 damage, right? And this 2d6 damage at the low end is only 2, right? And at the up end is all the way up to 12, which is a meaningful difference. The difference between 2 and 12 is pretty big. But looked at versus the health numbers of this unit, it's not going to mean I can kill five of these units with one attack or I can only kill one of these units with one attack, right? Um, it changes that math a lot. So once you start introducing randomness to an equation, make sure that you've given yourself a level of granularity that you can work with so that that randomness is not going to be adding huge percentages or low percentages to what you're doing, right? Um, and the easiest way to visualize this, of course, is the if you only have an attack of one and you give yourself a bonus of one, then you've doubled your attack. But what you really want to be looking at is overall, how much percentage chance do you, what is the percentage change that you want something to be, right? So if I say, and this is me doing math in my head, I'm sorry, it's not exactly right. But if I do 2d6, ooh, wait, um, let's do 1d10, the math will be easier. If I do 1d10 damage to something, right? Um, and that thing has between 10 and 100 hit points, then I'm actually saying the level of randomness is 10% of the greatest number of hit points that that thing could have, which suddenly becomes a lot less than the randomness of being 100 to, you know, what? 100 to 100% of the damage. So it's, Excuse my silly math, I'm confusing myself. But you get the point! Um, by having the greater greater granularity, um, you actually have a lot more ability to put random numbers in that are meaningful but not overwhelming. So, that's my little lesson on randomness, um, random numbers and games. I hope that is helpful to you. Um, I promised myself I'd keep that reasonably short. I think I made that in under half an hour, we'll see. Um, I'll have more of these fun little lectures on uh, very specific tactical parts of game development. I believe, um, Carla, what's what's my next week? I, I believe next week we're going to be talking about um, map building. I think we're actually going to, I think I'm going to go through in detail and talk about building maps for strategy games and uh, specifically building world maps and how building a world map uh, relates to culture and lore 
in building a world, uh, which is a very different thing than talking about random numbers. So I hope these little fun mini lectures are interesting and fun. Um, and I'll see you next week for that. Oh, I should also mention, by the way, at the bottom of the screen, you see on the it talks about the Discord. Um, if you're if this is interesting and you want to know more about the game that I'm talking about, which is Last Regiment, by all means, uh, come to our Discord and uh, check that out. If you have questions or you want to talk to me about what you saw on this, or you disagree, or you want to add something to that, by all means, come to our Discord. Uh, the Booms App Strategy Game Discord has all kinds of information, all kinds of fun people. So come check us out there. And that's it. Uh, I'll see you guys next week.